Yo. Yo. <coughs> How are you? How you doing? I'm good. How are you? You up in Maine? Yeah, man. Give me a little uh, look. What's that? Show me. Show me the view. Uh. What? What? That's uh. uh this is we're on a screened-in porch. That's our big red barn in the back. That's uh. Nice. You got a hoop in that barn? Not yet. Um. Got a. Uh, that's a uh, about you know, you know, four tenths of a mile from the ocean. So, how was your swim? So kind of can run down there or bike down. That's like a good background here. Yeah. Um, it's uh, yeah, so right down the road from the ocean, and it's great. You're you're like in the shadows, man. I know because it's really bright here. I can't see my thing. But uh, check this out. Oh, look at that. Very nice. I'm learning to surf too, Chief. What's that? Surf. Learn how to stand a paddle surf. Is that uh is it a house or is it a condo? What is it? House. Oh, nice. Very yeah. nice. Crazy man, I've never been a water guy my lot my whole life. I mean, I'm you know, I go to the beach. Wow, oh, there's, there's only one kind of water, man. Ocean water. That's awesome. So, do you, is there is there is there a uh, is that rocky or you got? Can you jump in right there? Um, it right there. That is like a that that's rocky. That is not a beach. Um, there's a beach kind of down the way, but it's the better beach is like. You know, I can see it from here, but there's like yeah. a, know, half a mile away. There's like the oh. East Tunic Beach, which is like kind of a um, kind of a go to beach. I, I'm really not a beach guy. I don't love the beach. Like, no, I, I don't love the beach either, but I love I love being in the water. I love being in the water. And so like now I, I, I get out there every day, either on my stand up paddle board and I just like learn how to surf waves on that thing. Or I got this lie down paddle board. You seen those like loan those those lie down prone paddle boards are like twelve feet long and you just basically it's like swimming on them actually. I, I mean you know my my surfboard I have is I have an eleven I could probably I, I'm basically doing that because I'm trying to teach myself how to do it so that's a crazy workout just yeah I was never like I was an average very average swimmer and it's just you need to be in shape to be really good at that stuff you know you so do, yeah no doubt well, basically i do that so you do you do the stand you're riding the waves on the stand up and yeah. then just kind of doing some paddling with the with the long board yeah the longer board i would just do on a day where there was like no waves or if i just felt like just getting a workout in and i can right. go like i don't know if you can see this but like see the difference on the beach yeah and way down, there's like rocks down there. I can go all the way down there on my on my lie down. I can go like two miles easily on that thing and just cruise. Yeah, I might. Just I might have to, and now, is that a is that not a board you can ride, or is it specifically for that? It's not really a board you would ride. Although some guys kind of like get on their knees right. on those things and ride. Yeah. Some ways. I've messed around on it a little bit. That's but... right. That's right. Are you wearing a wetsuit? <clears throat> wetsuit top. Yeah, the water's I, warm I, here though. It's like seventy yeah. degrees right now. Wow, you don't need. I, I mean, I wouldn't need it. I just go with it. Um, yeah. And the stand up is the stand up paddleboard surf. Stand up paddleboarding is fine, but it's a little boring. But when you like catch waves on it, it's like yeah. absolutely addicting. I, I it's my I favorite. Was, I was watching a guy do it yesterday. It was fucking pretty. It was you got to cool. get one. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I've never been like, like I I picked up snowboarding like because i skateboarded when i was younger but like i haven't been able to do the stand-up really well I, I, it's know, a, no now. listen it, it'll take you a little while the stand-up yeah. for me it took me like i don't know 15 times to not fucking fall in every two seconds and then eventually i just started learning how to not fall in was it was it, a strength to thing? it had to be kind of a strength thing a little bit right it's a strength thing it's just or like a balance. balance thing you're just not used to balancing you know and you're yeah. like and then you kind of like learn how to balance like now and the board matters. I don't know what kind of, I mean, like I, if you get kind of a bigger recreational board and, and, and you need the right volume too. So like 
you got to look at the volume. Like if your volume yeah. is like less than your body weight, it's going to be harder for you to stand up on it. If your volume of your board is around your body weight, um, then it's a lot easier. And the volume of it like kind of tells you what you can do. And then like catching waves, it's not the hardest part is just timing it. Like if it's a really big wave, I wouldn't try, but like, I usually just go out there when they're mellow. Like this morning, me and Sarah went out there and I don't know, I caught like 10 waves in an hour and it was sick and it was chill. Cause it was not big waves today when it's bigger, it's more fun and, and it's a way better workout, but it's kind of way I look at it is if I don't catch one wave and I fall off constantly, it's just an insane workout and it's fun. And then eventually I will be able to be pretty good at it. Yeah. That's, that's cool, man. Your place looks, your place looks amazing. I'm trying to get us down. We got, we got this place for a really good price. I'd like to be, I'd be, I'd, I'd like to be on the water. Um, that, that comes with challenges. I think obviously with paint and the, the oh, yeah. effects of the ocean oh. and everything. Did, what yeah. do they What do they say about that? Is, is Is your house a new build or renovated or it's new? It's like it was built in 2016. Yeah. So a lot of people say, yeah, there's a decent amount of maintenance because of the yeah. There's going to be a ton. And, and yeah. but we're gonna re we we rent this thing. Yeah. You know, we we oh, gifted sure. it to your boy Will for his honeymoon second for his real honeymoon. But uh, but <laughs> but for the most part, you know, we'll rent this thing for you know, like 1500 bucks a night. Wow. We just got a 1300, 1500. So we can, we can basically try to make back a majority yeah. of the, of the um, mortgage and we won't get here until July. Yeah. We'll try to rent it between October, basically between October through June and then just make as much of it as we can back. And then it's just like, what you would, you know, then you're paying like the kind of money that you would pay on a, on a rental anyways. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're, 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 we're renting maybe six, seven weeks a year. So yeah, we're cut, we're covering our mortgage, but I, I just like to be closer. We're close, but I'd, I'd like to be closer. <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, can you hear those cars in the background or no? No. Okay. I'm good. Um, all right. Let's kick this thing off, man. And we'll keep this thing like just under an hour and it'll be perfect. Yeah. Um, all right, ready? Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to get some good stuff. We'll we'll promote you and you know we're we'll use some uh clips and bits from uh this for pre prior, you know, preparing yeah, battle for sure. nine one. Um okay. How's it going, everybody? I am fired up to welcome Jerry Byrne back to the Phil Acrosophy podcast. Jerry is the head lacrosse coach at Harvard University. And uh, one of my favorite guys to talk lacrosse with, to talk defense with, to talk music, movies, you name it. How you doing, GB? I am. Life's pretty good. Life's pretty good. Survived the uh, the uh, baton march of June and July recruiting, and now getting ready for you know return to the players on September first. Nice man. Um, hey, congrats on a six season, man. What what a, what a way for the Ivy League and for Harvard to uh, get back into the NCAA tournament. Um, phenomenal year. Um, just talk to us a little bit about how excited you are to be able to build on that. You know, I, I, I'd be lying to you if I thought that's the way it would have ended um, or, you know, the, the, you know, making the NCAA tournament at, at the end. Um, you're always hopeful as a coach that it was, that it would come to that. Um, but as a coach in, in our situation with the league and COVID, you know, we we were excited just to to do the day to day work of getting better as coaches and getting better with our team, and you know, so yeah, you know, it was very um, rewarding, but also you know, unbelievably inspired by our players and the support of the school, and yeah, you know, just makes you hungry for what can happen this year and years going forward you know only one team gets to have the hat with the tag at the end of the season so the rest of us have to rationalize progress and achievements and milestones which which is not wrong but i can tell you that um as a culture the the team's really excited as a staff we've essentially stayed intact we have a new ops uh, director of ops and uh you know i think the future is has no limit Love it. It was crazy for you guys to kind of have like three freshman classes last year, of which 
um, you had a lot of contributions. You know, you talk a little bit about culture. What was it like to have to have a young team? And how were you able to like rely on the older guys that maybe didn't even know you that well because you hadn't had a, that much chance to coach them? Well, I, I had I definitely have more gray in my beard after the last uh, last 24 months. It used to be completely red and blonde. So the. You know what what it's like, you know, it's it's unknowable. Anybody who tells you that, oh, you knew I knew this was gonna happen and this was inevitable, you know, is not telling is not telling the truth. There's a there's a mysterious quality anytime you put a group of people together. I don't care if it's a group of insurance salesmen or a group of, you know, 18 and 19 year olds in a locker room. You you think you know what you've recruited. And and the, their values and their their character and their characteristics, but you know leadership as a coach and with your staff, their ability to receive and process information, and then their ability to execute and, and pressure. You know, it's not like the movies. And so, what it was like, it was it was, you know, exciting and inspiring and unnerving at times and. But it was really joyful, and I I really believe that kind of the mix of the the upperclassmen, you know, uh, several classes that that we inherited when we got here to Harvard, you know, their leadership and their kind of what's the word I'm looking for? Their I guess appreciation for a new exciting future meshed with you know young eighteen and nineteen year olds who were who didn't know any better other than they knew why they came, they believed in the vision, and they were not afraid of the work to to go about doing it. And it led to, you know, some real highs and some real close losses and, you know, an abrupt end in the NCAA tournament that I think is really kind of the jet fuel for where this can go in the next couple of years. Yeah, so exciting. Um, you know, you definitely have philosophies you know, on both sides of the ball, um, probably with your culture too. But my question is, how do you, how would you say you mold your team and your players to your philosophies versus mold your philosophies to your team and your players? You know, I think it's always a mixture of, of both our, you know, our fundamental tenet and philosophy of our culture is 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 really simple and if i i'm not known for my brevity at times but i'll do my best yeah is that you have to have a a bedrock kind of gratitude and appreciation for being at a place like home that you don't get here through luck you get here through kind of hard work and, and great parents and unbelievable mentors, whether they're teachers or coaches or family members, you know, it, it really takes a village to get someone to Harvard. And you can't look at it like I did this. I did this by myself. I made this happen. Nobody helped me, which is the classic kind of American kind of mindset is I did it all by myself. Look at me. And so that's really something that I preach. And it's really the, 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 basically the only brick and it's a massive brick that we build off of. Cause if you have that, if you have a sense of kind of appreciation and connection to all these people that helped you get here besides your own hard work, because you have to do that as well, then every decision you make from there, whether it's being, you know, how well you do in school, how you carry yourself socially at Harvard Square, the effort that you put in before and after practice or before and after class, how you treat other people, you know, respect for all the institutions that that make Harvard unique. If you have that, man, there's there's your program, the ceiling is is limitless. So that kind of really was the the fundamental thing. Mm -hmm. It's what we talk about, and it's the only thing we talk about in our first meeting and we do different things, different activities with the team to reinforce um, that. And then as far as kind of maybe philosophies that I brought from, you know, past parts of my 
career. I think you're always adapting those things because, you know, I, even from a defensive standpoint, I'm I'm always thinking about, hey, do we play picks different? Do we, you know, place, you know, the concept of switching and matchups a little bit different because just because it worked in the past, you know, it may not continue to work because the game is evolving. And if you don't evolve along with it, then you can get left behind. So you have to be open to the fact that maybe some of your own fundamental coaching tenets may not uh, still apply in this, maybe to the same depth that it did 10 years ago. So I think, you know, there's, there's non-negotiables and kind of fundamentals that will always be. And I think how I view you know, how guys get to Harvard and their place in the community here. I don't, that that's never going to change because I think that's just fundamental to how great communities are built, but mm. relative to how you manage people and how you build a team, you know, I think you always have to be willing to make tweaks and adaptations here and there. Interesting. Yeah. It's all about attitude, right? I mean, that's really what you're talking about is just this, this, uh, this feeling of gratitude and appreciation um, helps an attitude of uh, that will, outwardly show that and motivate you to do things for others and and to be a part of a team and and to give because you know you've received and all these things yep so what are some of the non-negotiable you know elements of your defense you know i think you know i think language and your ability to communicate forcefully and specifically and directly and in a tone that that leaves no doubt with what you're trying to tell a teammate or describe a situation that that is that's a thing that we work on every day and we we have a couple of drills that reinforce that and and we'll we'll start really early in the fall with a couple of different communication drills and 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 it may be a drill that a freshman is only maybe repped out a handful of times, and then he will be the have to be the guy who's in charge. Because you're trying to find out does does the guy get it intellectually? Can he communicate it in a tone and in a in a forceful nature to a senior who's three or four years older than him, has done the drill a hundred times? You know, you have to find that out because I, I say all the time better to be loud and wrong than quiet and right. And, you know, a guy who's loud and wrong, you can correct a guy who's quiet and right. You have to guess what he's thinking and what he believes and what his body language may be showing you or showing the rest of the team. So that's always a fundamental element and a, and a non-negotiable uh, part of our program. Uh, a second one is really kind of breaking down you know, the 10 or 15 situations that regardless of your opponent that you're going to see in nearly every game and, and practicing those peer to peer with, with all defensemen, defensemen playing the role of the offensive player where you can do it, be create this kind of non-stressful situation because it's your, you and your teammates and your teammates are playing the role of an offensive player and you're, you're basically get going through kind of, you know, um, modeling or previewing of things that they can see so that when you get to scrimmages or you get to games, they're seeing stuff about to happen. They have, they can recruit it in their mind. They can marry it with scouting report stuff. And they've seen what it looks like before. And they see A and B. And they might not know that C is going to happen, but they know that C is one of the options and they have to prepare their body. So whether it's playing two man and hedging, you know, throwing backs, you know, how you do that footwork, how you do that language, which happens a lot. And, you know, guys are coming into Harvard and other teams, you know, playing it differently with different language. You got to practice that and you got to do it in a non-threatening full speed manner so that when you get to really, stressful game situations it looks familiar so i think those two things are really kind of fundamental stuff that we do every day in practice so interesting the the concept of perception action coupling is um a, a terminology i learned from this guy alex sarama you should check him out he's an unbelievable uh basketball mind 
Um, and I've learned a lot from him. And he talks about this from, from like this ecological psychology approach. And essentially that's how humans function. You perceive what's happening around you and you make decisions to do things. And that, those decisions manifest themselves in communication and what you say and what you, what you understand. Um, obviously the volume part is something that they got to, you know, get some confidence in and practice, but, but what you see and how quickly you can process that and then communicate is, is easier than just saying I'm hot, you know, all of a sudden, right. you know, I remember watching, um, a, a, a Notre Dame game from a few years ago with Eddie Glazner and just watching him break down these situations stopping the film and how many things are going on as the ball moves, as people are dodging and dumping and throwing and moving off ball is, is unbelievable. And, and that kind of le leads itself into this, this 10 or 15 situations that you're constantly going through to basically teach these guys how to, you know, understand what they're perceiving so that they, they, they can then communicate it. And it's really interesting because I feel like the way you guys do it, is is with ton with is almost like um this like you said non stressful it's almost like free play in a way it's it's scripted in but there's options and there's actual reads there's actual you know your offense is giving reads to the defense the defense is giving reads back to the defense um and I just wanted you to sort of elaborate on that if you could yeah you know your you know it, it's it comes back to kind of a lot a lot of your philosophy around you learn by by playing and you learn by doing it's less of a top down approach it's really yeah. a peer to peer mm. you know free play like we learned going down to play pickup basketball down the street right our parents weren't there saying you know run the picket fence they were you know you were down there and you you know you learned the you know the biology and the chemistry of competition and who your big rivals were and you know the 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 ego to stay on a pickup court that drove yeah. your competition, your, you know, so I never thought about it in the way of, of psychology. I, I always thought about it from, all right, if I'm going to have 25 moments of positional, 25 minutes of positional teaching and a practice for argument's sake, you know, as a head coach, I can obviously make it whatever I want, but I do, you know, create these finite windows of teaching is, me talking for a long time is not going to get them better. Me being on a whiteboard is not getting better. If I can create these small group um, um, drills that teach multiple elements, they can teach each other. I can look, I can be like quality control. I can be like the factory manager, you know, being on the intercom and, and stop every minute. Hey, let's make sure you know, on that drop step, you're swinging your arms and you're sneaking a peek back to where you're leaving and where you're going. And then you're back to doing it. We're not coming back together. I'm talking for four minutes. We have a drill. The upperclassmen are leading the drill. Sometimes it's the underclassmen. It's three or four people. They claim a piece of turf and they're out there doing it. And you have to presume there's an element of imperfection to that, that as a coach, you have to be okay with. And then that's where you use film and you use right. score break and some of the different things. You don't stop and have long speeches. You have them do, you let them critique each other, let them teach each other. Let's one guy lead one day, another guy lead another. And then you'll see it in scrimmages and six on six. And you use the film to create, create that you're guaranteeing reps, you're guaranteeing progress. And as a coach, you're learning who's, who gets it and who needs separate coaching? Because some guys like Glaze, Glaze was, you know, was freakishly talented in his ability to do this stuff. I could talk to him and be like, hey, we're playing this team next week. They're going to do a lot of pick and pop. We got to practice to switch. We got to be able to spike from GLE. I want you to create, uh, we're going to create this five person drill. You know, he could totally get it and he could run the, the whole thing and I could do something else. So, <laughs> you know, you're, you're fortunate to, when you can find guys like that for sure. Is it fair to say these drills are situations? Correct. They are totally they're, and, they're situations and decisions. Right. And, 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 and therefore the situations there's, it, it's not like a scripted, you're only doing this. It has to do with, you know, the way that the defender plays the ball, which might be uh, to give a look of how they got beat, 
right? I mean, you have to actually be able to play the ball in such a way that you're giving a read to your sliding and second sliding teammates that 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 you're actually getting beat and, and giving them that. Yep. Tool. Um, yeah, and we, we, we're not. We will, uh, we will, like in the beginning, we'll script A happens. We want you to make B decision. And then over time and maybe within the same week, hey, we'll we'll we want you to make a mistake on ball because part of playing good off ball defense is is reading mis- not just great plays that opponents make that's how i think a more standard approach would be is i wait for this guy to make the i presume my teammate's going to do everything right yeah let's wait for the great play from the opponent my view of is it is being prepared for the intersection of the great play and the biggest mistake so if you if you're reading both of those things, sometimes they both happen and it's an intersection. Other times it's it's one or the other. Yeah. And so you practice mistakes that your teammates may make. You don't you, you don't want them to make mistakes, but they're human. They make mistakes. And so teaching your five off ball guys to see when bad things are about to happen yeah. is is a tremendous skill. And the only way you can work on that for your other five guys is practicing you know their stance and how they how they exit their off ball responsibility so they can put themselves in optimal places to make those reads yeah it's so interesting so the situations are creating reads and decisions that are being made from there and that's what's so interesting about you know what i've always loved about sort of watching the way you coach and what you do is is that you've been able to sort of scale this across a bunch of different groups and it's not just about pure technique. I'm sure that there's things that you really want people to do as a way, maybe the way they approach or whatever, but everyone is a little different and every situation is a little bit different. And really the definition of skill is technique plus decision. And so by integrating that into what you're doing is in my opinion, like the brilliance of, of the way you coach defense. No, guys are gonna get run by guys make really good plays, you know, you can't, you can't snuff that out, you know? And so if you start with that presumption that guys are going to make mistakes and good players are going to make really good plays on offense, really working on the other five guys um, is I think the most critical thing to play in really good defense is that, you know, you can't stop everybody. No, you know, Matt Landis was a great, defenseman had a great game against you know lyle thompson lyle senior year but you know you know landis got slid to probably 10 times in that game and yep it was the team it was you know, that that really kind of you know made that happen i mean matt did it had an unbelievable game totally. it's really yep. five other guys who consistently supported yeah i've actually watched that i have that i have that all clipped out um Actually, I think Lax Film Room clipped it out. And I think I've just watched that thing probably like 10 times with the uh, athletes I work with. It's phenomenal. And you're right. They, they were helping. But, you know, he was great. Well, one of the things that I know you always sort of talk about in terms of like a principle and a, and a fundamental is ball pressure. Um, you know, which is one of the reasons why you love and teach V-holds. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of ball pressure? And I have some questions about V-holds and, and, the, and the concept of holding in general. Yeah, I think... You know, I, I think one of the hardest, you know, some of the hardest habits to break when high school guys come in is is kind of almost redefining what ball pressure means. They oftentimes think ball pressure is how many times can I slash a guy in a, a 10 second window as he gets close to GLA or he gets down the hash. And, you know, not that you never slash. It's not like, like I'm trying to prevent all, all of that, but I just I think simple you know, kind of poke and dig ball pressure is much more efficient. It's not as violent and it's not as sexy for sure, but I I feel like it's more, it's more um, effective. And so redefining that, you know, ball pressure, you know, simplest form helps take away a guy's hands and his eyes. If you can take away one of those two things, you're doing a good job on ball. And uh, if you're doing neither of those things, you and and you play a help defense mentality, 
the guy who has his hands, you know, and his eyes, he's really, you know, and you see it in the NBA a lot when, when guys step away and they're trying to help to, to Steph Curry and he steps away and he obviously gets off a three, but he also can, you know, kick the ball to, to Draymond or Clay Thompson because, you know, the, their definition of what ball pressure is at odds with, with what your opponent's skill set is. And, and so, you know, the slashing versus poking and digging is, is something that we really work on a lot when we get new guys into the program. And then, you know, through programs that you've done, kind of the multi-step dodger who's mixing speeds and footwork and, you know, um, subtle, you know, chin and head and elbow and hand work from the box game. You know, some guys are really good at that. And they're reading as you step away, you know, are you winding up for a slash that they can split or redodge? You know, are you going for a nugget? Like he's he's selling, like he's going to feed and you're trying to get your stick up there and then they redodge that, you know, we're constantly in the battle of, how do you deal with a change of speed, change of direction, half rocker, you know, the stuff that you've taught for a decade of elbows and hands and chins, really subtle thing. How do you not fall for that? How do you have the discipline to kind of redefend? is probably one of the, that, the, the poke and dig versus the slash and the kind of the, the dodge bounce, redodge battle, the game within the game between dodger and defender and how you re-engage and have to, how do you get, ball pressure again with a guy who's now two and a half yards away from you. Are you lunging and being the zombie, which is what I call the guy who's reaching like this, or do you have the discipline to chop back up and get into him and not fall for all the bells and whistles so that, you know, that's really kind of, to me, the essence of ball pressure as as well as with kind of approaches and, and, and your discipline and footwork and and doing that. And, you know, the, the, the V hold, I just, I just, you know, I just think, you know, it, it helps take away hands and eyes and it makes it easier to determine whether you're going to have to help somebody or not. Yeah. And, you know, and that, it, it continues with um, ball pressure. No doubt. No doubt. It's so, just interesting. You, you, you once a couple of years ago, you talked about this, you characterize it as capturing them in a, in a V hold. Ever since I heard you say that I've used it a million times and it's just made me think about it. You know, holding is a 30 second penalty if you really hold somebody, but there are degrees in which, you know, just like in basketball, hand checking, you're allowed to hold people a little bit. And when you hold them, you slow them down. And when you capture them, you slow them down and give yourself opportunities to read double teams or slides while you have ball pressure. And, you know, I, I kind of feel like capturing people isn't just in a V hold. It could be in a reverse V hold. It's almost like you would capture somebody uh, with a cross check hold at times. I mean, if you can, if you can give with it, if you try to push people out all the time, they're going to spin on you or create separation. There's a time to bump and there's a time to capture. Um, can you talk about that? When you would kind of want to bump people off track versus when you would want to kind of give with it and capture them so that you can. Yeah. control. I, I, th- I think a lot of like, you know, if you're thinking about a guy dodging from X or off X, you know, like how you teach it really is, is along a spectrum of self-awareness around who who am I as an athlete? Who am I guarding? You know, and, you know, I think, you know, coming back to a guy like, you know, Glaze, that was, a, that was an important thing for him. He came from a a background of, of takeaway checks and, and really pressing out. And, you know, I remember telling him that you can get back to some of that, but for you to be a really good defenseman on ball, you need to really kind of understand your skill set and your range. And so, you know, Glaze dodging, you know, defending, uh, you know, a, a grand amen from X, he's probably going to get more, you know, well, I, you know what, I think a better example is, you know, like Kevin Rice, when Kevin Rice was at Syracuse, the hell of a player, he made a living getting up to like the island. And he was he was nifty and quick. He wasn't like a straight ahead burner, but he was very elusive and obviously a very good player. But he made a living of getting to the island. Yep. 
And then, you know, Donnie, would be lurking with his left hand cuts and they, you know, just abused everybody, you know? And so, you know, for, for Landis, Landis could probably be righty against righty, a butt end drive up to GLE. And then he could get into the V hold athletically and be, and capture and be disruptive, maybe closer to GLE than Glaze could be. If Glaze was getting dodged from X by Kevin Rice and for you young guys out there, you know, watch highlights of Kevin Rice. He was a hell of a player at Syracuse and, uh, Blaze would have to get capture him in the V hold a couple of yards before GLA mm -hmm. because he, you know, didn't have the same level of agility. Both could be effective. And you, when you watch Glaze guard in, uh, in the PLL, he guards everybody just because I think he, he knows his game. He knows his range. He knows his footwork. He knows the opponent, which are all kind of, you know, great skills for, for a defenseman to have. So I, you know, the capturing element really is a function of you understanding the skills of your opponent and you having self-awareness of, you know, I might want to do what that guy does, but I can't. Right. So that adaptation, I think, and that awareness is really critical. So many kids, when I start working them, they're always like, I just don't like the holds because I just get beat too fast. And, and um, I'm sure you've heard this before. And there's a pretty easy little uh, trick on that one. Maybe not easy, but but it makes a lot more sense. But what do you say to people that are like, I don't, I don't want to get inside rolled so quickly. Yeah. I want to be able to play defense and, 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 and how does that work? Cause it doesn't seem like you're really capturing a guy when they're spinning on you and scoring before anyone can even slide. Right. You know, I think there's two, two elements to that. One is the trust element. You know, I, I think there's a lot of defense being taught that is, you know, own your matchup kind of mm -hmm. just own your matchup mindset, which is, you know, easier said than done. Yeah. You know, that was, that was much more kind of our generation, which was much more of kind of a gunslinger Western kind of two guys on the end line, like in the, like the Western show shootout, you know, and she was the like Lake Placid, um, yeah. uh, over 50, over 45, 50, 50, 50 plus, 50 plus <laughs> pillow fight. Um, Burnsy goes over and, your head and comes back with a really quick back. Yeah, exactly. Wrap. No, you know, I think part of it is a trust thing that, you know, and it's and it's and it's multi-directional. I have to, as an off-ball guy, I have to trust that you're going to guard in the way that you're taught. And as the on-ball guy, that I, if I do what I'm being taught, that you're going to be there to help me. So you have to have both of those, you know, pillars um, in place. And and like when we do one-on-ones, which is not a lot, we don't we we always have a help person so that you know makes it more realistic and the off-ball guy can practice. Um, the decisions he has to make if a guy gets beat topside or if he gets beat underneath. Um, I think the second part of it is coming back to that, you know, Landis Glazner um, do you know dichotomy is um, the if you wait too long if you're if, if it's righty against righty if I'm guarding you Jamie and I'm butt end drive and I'm at GLE and all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my God, I got to get him to V-hold. And I swing it, my stick. I end up getting, you know, we call it getting scissored. Yeah. My my right foot and my left foot end up like this. They're split. And my stick is obviously kind of out now in a V-hold. And I'm in the straight line with my my stick and my my right foot. And, yeah, if you get inside roll there, you're, you're, you're probably falling over. Yeah. You know? And so and getting if you wait scissored is basically – when you're still running, when you're trying to V-hold a guy. Right, exactly. And especially if your hips get above their hips. And and I love, you know, uh, Andrew Baxter, I'll give him a shout out. He he calls it, you know, getting water, water skiing because you end up like with your hands over your feet. I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always give him a shout out and when I say it to my guys. So you end up kind of scissored and water skiing at the same time, which, you know, I failed at water skiing a lot. So I know what that, how that ends with you on your face and getting dragged yeah. across the water. So, uh, so if you wait too, yes, if you wait too long, you know, you're probably going to get run through or, or fall over and get water skied and uh, water skiing and, and, and scissor. So if you, uh, you know, so doing it at, in, in this, you know, it doesn't have to be an optimal moment. There's a window of how, how you do it. And glaze became really good at, 
recognizing that window. You know, you have to practice it and you have to practice it in a small drill stuff. And then you have to practice with your slide guys when a guy's water skiing and when he's scissoring so you can see that if if that guy plants an inside rolls, it's probably going to have to yeah. come. But you also have to practice going halfway and practice going three quarters of the way and practice and going all the way. You know, again, it's a lot of nuance and a lot of iterations of, of things, but it starts with, you know, recognizing when mistakes are made or when your opponent makes a really good play. Right. Um, all right, let's switch gears and talk a little offense. And, you know, you, you referenced the fact that you are just on the, on the road recruiting. I think, I think uh, you are definitely known as, as a defensive guy and you've got a way of playing that you've really had an impact, I think on the game of lacrosse and the way you coach. Um, but let's talk about offense and just sort of philosophically um, what you, what you want people to know about that the way you guys want to play and what those non-negotiables and fundamentals and, and how they evolve into, you know, being a high powered offense that in this day and age might need to score 16 or 17 or 18 goals to win a game. Yeah, I think, you know, Neil Hutchinson, um, our offensive coordinator, and, and Will Corrigan, who supports him, have done a, have done a great job with, you know, a, an eclectic uh, mix of guys from all over the country and different ages and different kind of pathways to to Harvard. You know, I, I, I've worked with Neil to do – to kind of invert – or to do the inverse of what we do defensively. Like, you know, there are certain things that certain teams do a lot and, and we need to be prepared for that, whether it's, you know, and I think a lot of it is how teams, you know, play pops behind the ball, how teams play kind of backside exchanges, how, you know, what, where teams of it, you know, a dodge from the wing or the corner of a near pipe and far pipe. So a lot of like, small group stuff similar to what we work on defensively that we do offensively, you know, what is the X attack been doing as far as, you know, drifting or following. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, that, that KC did, you know, well at Notre Dame, you know, with Ryder and Cav and, you know, how, how you screw with, you know, teams that fake slide, basically, you know, we don't do that. They don't see that a lot you know, in our practices, but a lot of teams do it kind of fake that you're going to go and his guy pops and they chase back. So, you know, multi-speed dodging without totally slowing down, you know, and this comes back to a lot of the stuff that you taught at, at 3D is, you know, the subtle look back with the chin or the, the half cradle, you know, the lever pass, the lever fake, you know, that don't look like fakes. They look, you're much like trying to teach a defense, a sliding defenseman to have no indication whether he's going to go or not go. I hate the concept of the fake slide. I've never taught that. I'm trying to teach you to put yourself in a position footwork and stance wise that allows you to make every decision. So you're trying to do the same thing with a dodger from the wing and there's a pop behind the ball and there's a drifting attackman across X. How can that guy do everything? Lever throwback throw across X, bear in without kind of indicating which thing the guy may do. And you brought a lot of that from basketball and your, and your coaching and your own philosophy. So we, knowing that our opponents are going to do that stuff on, on defense, really pushing Neil Hutchinson to integrate, to create drills that make us good at that. And so that's really kind of the fundamental of us, our, us defensively late turn-ins deep carry rollbacks all the options and footwork and things that you're going to get against teams that hedge from the crease slide hedge and chase back across x you got to do the footwork and the handwork and the and the language and the passes that expose that how much is communication a part of your offense um you know it was by far the the, the number one um fundamental of your defense how does that fit in offensively you know i think they're you know they do a lot of the same things but i think you there's only i think there's a fine line there 
because you know the the offensive guy has to if he's processing too much right he's he's paralyzed through analysis and so there's i think it's it, i think it's a little bit less but it's probably that much more powerful versus kind of the constant communication that we're looking for um defensively you know I, sometimes the, an off ball guy needs to make the take the decision out of the Dodgers hands because he sees something that the Dodger might not see mm -hmm. you know the Dodger independent of communication has to know that his teammates are getting into their optimal range of positioning so that a guy who's dodging has a sense of where his options are you know but but I but I, I know one of the things that we worked on last year was you're never going to know exactly with perfection because some teams will make some changes game to game. You can't be trying to learn everything on every dodge, right? You have to start with, I'm running by you and I'm getting to the goal or I'm getting to a dangerous spot. You have to start with that, uh, um, you know, objective. If you don't have that, then you're dancing. And I hate dancing. I hate dancing at a wedding and I hate dancing on offense. <laughs> so, so in the end, you're, what you're referencing is creating an advantage through the dodge. So, so right. you need a score if they don't slide or draw a slide, in which case you can start, you know, finding, finding open people. Yeah. So let's, let's transition into creating advantages with two man game where you can, uh get two on one if one person switches and one person stays it's two on one or create an advantage a positional advantage because of the angle uh let's just say uh, you're going under a pick or someone's going under a pick and, and 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 you recognize that as the dodger and you slow down a little bit and you recognize that as the picker and you adjust your pick to make them run farther underneath it now you've just created a positional advantage where you've got a straighter line and, you, you get the advantage of the shortest distance between two points is a straight line versus that, that defender on ball. Now who has to run around a pick, or maybe it's on ball. If you're pushing over a pick and somebody can kind of hezzy you a little bit and put you in a trailing position. And now all of a sudden you've got a positional advantage that warrants a, a slide, which is going to get two on one. Where does that fit in to the, um, to, to the model? I, I definitely saw you guys running some two man games. Yeah, no, no. Neil, Neil is a, huge believer and i you know not i wouldn't say that i'm resistant to it um i come i came at it from this approach that not everybody's good at it and do you have enough time to get not not everybody's is too sim, so simplistic is the predominant are the can can you get the predominance of your offensive guys up to a certain level of being you know you know manageable to really good at it, you know, and, and as a result, if you presume that, and that you don't have enough time to get everybody really good at it, how do you, how do you create the scenarios that, that you're talking about? So you can, so you can create disadvantages for um, the defense. And so that was kind of my approach relative to it, that, that not everyone has the stick work. Not everyone has the footwork. Some guys have never been taught it. Some guys have been taught it poorly for so long that much like a golfer, you'd have to kind of re recreate their swing. And do you have enough time to do that? So kind yeah. of our approach was that we worked on it, but we also back stepped back and said, these guys, we can do that really well. And we can do it, you know, whether it's razor picks or, you know, up picks, you know, from, from the crease at, you know, from corner dodges and things like that. And, yeah. but, but also looked at it two other different ways, Jamie. One was much like the inverse of defensively where you were practicing um, mistakes that or really good plays that your opponents would make or mistakes that the defense would make practicing. All right. If we do this and we do it well, and, and they make, that mistake what do you expect of your other four guys mm. so we 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 worked we worked on on that and also worked on it through the prism of you know when you're playing a certain opponent this is how they play 
picks. They're going to stack and whack. So Mm -hmm. let's practice accelerating through that because we know they don't want to switch and this is going to be a a slash, just run through it. Maybe we get a penalty or a hold, you know, or they're just going to stack and let the guy get through. And how do we take advantage of that as an individual Dodger? So we worked on both kind of elements of, of that. And, and when you do small group drills, like they were doing the inverse of what we do defensively, you can really teach and you can really find out who's, who's inherently good at it mm-hmm. and who, who's getting there and who's fucking never, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Leave that out is who's never going to get there. And let's not put that guy in that situation. Let's focus on something that yeah that's achievable for him. Not that you're giving up on a guy, but like, oh, yeah. let's try not to bang a square peg into a round hole. And so, sure. um, so yeah, we were doing a lot of that stuff. It comes back to just to, you know, to, to, that what's best for your team and your personnel to be able to win games. You know, yeah. it's just, it's just, it's interesting stuff. And it's, it's, it's where the game's going. I mean, if you kind of look at the NBA, it's just unbelievable where, you know, how much more picking is going on over the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. And, you know, you just can't stop it anymore. And to the point where everybody, sw- have, you kind of have to switch everything. And I kind of think that's going to happen eventually in lacrosse too. Cause as, as you try to stack and whack or stack and get under or get over, and people can really understand what those coverage solutions are. Um, you can take advantage of them at a higher level. And, and the advantage that the Dodger has inherently is that you can't equally guard the man towards the goal and towards the pick. And so therefore you can begin to learn how to use deception and hesitations and look offs. And you look at a guy like Jeff T is like the ultimate example. I always reference him because I'm just blown away by this guy's feel for the game and the way he just is deceptive. Um, but I think, um, you know, you look at like Luka Doncic there's some amazing videos by that guy, Alex Arami, you should check it out. But you know, the way that he just takes advantage of, of defenses in two man game, you're just probably better off switching than putting guy in your back. Now lacrosse and basketball are different. Um, but I do think uh, I do find it interesting to sort of think of where it's going to go as the game continues to evolve. And, and again, it's it's easy to be dogmatic. I mean, that, you know, I'm not saying it's wrong or or simple. You know, I, I think you're right. I, I think the game's so fluid and the and the players are so skilled. And you know, every day that we, you know, you, you start from your kind of you know, digestion of, of box and your embracing of that philosophy and mentality, it has spawned some really good stuff and some really poor versions, you know, and, but as more and more people adopt it, it's going to get, it's going to get better. And, you know, you, yeah, you think about, you watch some of those NBA games where Doncic is, is popping behind the thing and nobody's near him. I'm like, are you really going to give that guy an uncontested three? Yeah. That is that part of your kind of analytics? Like that's a good thing, but then you watch the you know the championship this year, and I don't know how many, you know, I don't watch a lot of NBA. I live in Boston now, so I watch the finals, and I'm a fan of of you know Steph Curry and and that team is uh, like it was probably the first finals where both teams switched nearly on everything, mm. and that you know, and again there was still a lot of scoring because it led to Mitch matches and things like that. But for years you'd watch pick and rolls where guys going down the, going down the block and just dunking, you know, on people. And like, there's only 10 of you out there. Is it really that hard to play a pick and roll? You know? And I guess it was, but now everybody's switching and there was still a good amount of scoring, but I yeah. think that you're right. I think that is the the future of you need guys who can play three, four five positions. And even if it might be imperfect, imperfect, I, you know, I always believe that. I always told, um, you know, my guys that uh, you need to be able to guard everybody. You need to be able to understand everybody on the offensive side of the ball. So. Yeah, I feel like you've always had a philosophy of we don't mind switching. You know, yeah, not just the right deal, but we can switch if we have. I just feel like uh, I'm going to go inside because my computer is about to run out of juice. Hold on. Walk with me. We're going into the uh, world, hec- world headquarters here. Hold the on. northern, the northern office. Well, the, the northern world headquarters, undisclosed location. Me and Dick Cheney. Um, <laughs> hold on a sec. Uh, um. So yeah, so you know, yeah. again, I don't believe in dogmatic 
approaches to stuff. I think the game's too fluid. Totally. Um, all right. Last topic. Let's talk about recruiting. Talk about Harvard, what you're looking for, and what you want people to know. Ooh, it's a loaded question. It's a lot of stuff. Can't wait to hear. You know? <laughs> I know it's uh, closing the door. Baby Doc Burns doing things. Um, She's tweeting. She is. She probably is. Um, uh, what do we want people to know? I mean, hey, I think it's a, it's a, it's a friendly, welcome and and open place that really it wants it wants their their graduates to go on and do great things that affect the world. And it might just be your little town that you live in, or it might be something global. Like that's the environment they're trying to create, one that is, you know, endless possibilities. And you know, we're 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 talking about the same thing within our program that, you know, we, we feel like we can make it to Memorial Day in the next few years. And so that's you know, that's what we're putting out there as our audacious goal and while but while we're pursuing that we want our guys to have that same kind of energy for what they're studying here and their pursuit of internships and kind of immersion in harvard and, and engagement with harvard you know we we know we have a great culture and guys enjoy each other's company and and that's amazing that if if any coach who's having any sort of success has to have that as a foundational element. But there's so many amazing people at Harvard that it would be kind of sad if all you did was hang out with your 50 guys on your team. That's going to happen naturally. And, right. And we want that to happen. And we're going to travel and practice. We're going to have thousands of hours together. But, you know, you're going to be in study groups and you're going to be in projects and you're going to, you know, your roommate might be some unbelievably – inventive you know creative person you might be you know the first employee in his app that he's developing you, know? yeah. and you have to be you know i i want them to have everything i want them to explore and enjoy everything at harvard not as a detriment to what we're trying to do as a team i don't think anyone who knows me well believes that we're not working hard and super engaged and trying to get better and you know want to win the last game of of the season we want that but we also want them doing great in school and meeting interesting people and taking the great professors at Harvard and exploring the great city of, of Boston and its history and Harvard's place in it. Like leaving here, not having done that, to me, that uh, that's could be one of the saddest things ever. So, you know, I believe that. I support the guys taking and studying whatever they want. And I think that happiness that they that that's not just words that they know that because we live it and they know cuz you know you know Joe Smith on our team has to leave practice 15 minutes early for his pre med lab or his engineering lab or so and so arrives a little bit late they see it every day and i know if i'm doing my part right in building our culture that i'll get that 15 minutes back times 10 through his kind of respect for us and respect for the team and his appreciation for our endor endorsement of that. So that's, that's what I hope people understand. Yeah. It's incredible. I mean, the, uh, the people that you can, obviously your teammates are going to have an amazing influence on you, but the whole, the community as a whole. Um, so what are some of the things that you do for your team as far as helping them network and integrate and meet the alums and, and be able to have Harvard um, and its its past teams and program uh, integrate with the, 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 the current team and program? You know, I, a lot of, I mean, I think we're doing a lot of the same fundamentals that any program is doing. We have teams up in Lake Placid, like a lot of, like a lot of teams do. We do an alumni game, alumni weekend every fall. We do an alumni weekend every spring or this one this past spring was for the Princeton weekend. It was, you know, it was an amazing, you know, we beat, you know, Princeton at home 
That was we a big one. We had 500 alumni wow. uh, in town. You know, they had a bar at the end of the field, which was the Crimson Pub was rocking <laughs> at the end. Of, at the, at what a the game. End. What a day, huh? Unbelievable weather. You know, great turnout. We had 3,000 people at the game. And and so so you're doing events like that. You do We do a big event in New York City, uh, fundraiser and alumni get together. So a lot of the same things that every team is doing, you know, we, you try to kind of, you know, match players with alums in different industries and, you know, you know, you know, you know, all the different levels of finance and wall street and there's six or seven different pathways guys can go there, but also sports marketing and law and service and education and everything that goes into that. So a lot of the same things that every team is doing and, and trying to do really well. We also kind of have really engaged on LinkedIn because not that I don't want to do it, but I'm trying to create a community that's less with me as a conduit and more, you know, Jamie Monroe as from the class of 91, Jerry Byrne from the class of, you know, 2024, those guys connecting independent of me. And, and LinkedIn is a great vehicle for that. We have both a public group and a private group. The private group allows for, you know, posting and message boards around internship and job opportunities, not just between you and me, who may be 30 years apart in graduation years, but also, you know, you and a classmate, you know, you're super successful. You have a classmate who's looking to invest in a new startup. Those guys can have those kind of conversations in the privacy of this, this group. So we've worked, invested heavily in creating that community and, and that network that I think that's been super important for us because it, it, it takes me out of the middle and it saves a step. Not again, I'm always going to be a part of that because you're yeah. going to ask me, Hey, what do you think about this junior who's applying for this internship? I'm always going to be an important part as a reference and, of course. and getting some color on a guy, but I'm trying to connect people directly and, and trying to get out of the middle as much as I can. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit more specifically on what you're looking for. Um, let's go at position. Give me some things that you're looking for out of a goalie. You know, guy saves the shots he should save and steals a couple. You know, that guy's a, a 55 to 60% guy. You know, I, I, um, recruiting the goalie position is, is difficult because, you know, in the summer – there's not great team defense on in the in general from the club teams. So you get a lot of layups. So obviously you want to see a guy who can steal some. So you get a lot of opportunity for that. But you don't get a lot of opportunity. You know, you got guys shooting from 14 who have 11 yard range. So mm -hmm. obviously catching those is really important. You don't, it's really kind of evaluating those those eight to 12 yard shots, you know, step downs and guy bearing in down the hash and things like that. So stealing a couple on the doorstep, saving appropriately guys who are shooting from the edge of their range. It's really kind of, you know, evaluating the shots that the guy's going to see most often at our level. And you, there's not always a volume of those for you to kind of predict. So that, that's what we're looking for for goalies. Obviously being a really good, you know, there's not a lot of riding in summer, club lacrosse so you know he's not making some of the decisions you're gonna have to see against nine and ten man rides so that's a little bit of a mystery but it's a, it's the same mystery for every coach um so that's what we'll yep. look for for goalies I, I don't look for goalies to be the general of the defense i'm not a believer in that philosophy at all all right how about defensively you know i i definitely you know, with the new rules and and everything, I definitely – I'm looking for athleticism and compete level. Everybody is. I'm looking – I'm watching a guy, how he changes direction, how he drops steps, and, and really kind of assessing of the things that I don't like of a guy, are they fixable? You know, or, you know, and it's hard to tell. You were going to call a coach. Oh, yeah, he's unbelievably coachable. Yeah, you, you hope that's true. But I'm looking for change of direction and drop step and efficiency of how they move, physical appropriate physicality, you know, around GLE and the island, 
and things like that. But also probably most as important is he's probably making mistakes. He's not, you know, everybody's getting beat for a goal and stuff like that. Why is, you know, of the mistakes he's making, what are fixable? And, um, and then, you know, compete, obviously compete level, change of direction, uh, east, west speed. Um, I used to never really care about stick handling, but with the clearing rules and everybody riding now, a guy's ability to handle and scoop and escape, you know, dodge, handle the ball in the clear has become much more important to me than it was maybe five to 10 years ago. Considering how much of a emphasis you put on communication and off ball and in the processing and perception that goes along with that, how do you evaluate if a guy's a smart player, if he sees it? Yeah. Can you tell? You know, I watch, like and I've said this before, I watch, you know, I watch a guy off ball, like after I've made a determination that I like that he's athletic, that he has those attributes on the ball, I spend almost all my time watching his stance and his engagement and his, you know, gesturing and his, so you watch that, you watch how they leave their man. And again, so you, you make, you're grading on a curve because you don't know what a guy has been taught and not been taught. So, you know, but a lot of times guys who play other sports and things like that will know how to do some of that stuff. So I spent a lot of time watching how much they care. Because I think caring is the gateway to coachability and their ability to make adjustments to either something that they were taught that I don't like or modifying it to fit into the way that we play. How about um, attack? And do you have sort of positions within positions? Definitely. I think I think one of the byproducts, and it's not a – yeah, you know, it's not a good thing or a bad thing or a judgment. I, I think like almost I, I feel like nearly every offensive possession I watch in the summer is exactly the same. A lot lot of, you know, a lot of lot of two man, but from you know, you know, really mediocre pass down, pick down stuff. So as a result, they've created types of attackmen. Lefty guy who's always on the wing, righty guy who's always on that wing. Maybe some inside guys, I, and you know I love a really good inside guy. Uh, but but the the kind of the classic X attackman is almost like a dinosaur because of because of there's so much kind of two man going on in the kind of wing and alley two man, and um, so finding a guy who's kind of a classic quarterback in in that mold is really hard to find, and a guy. Also, guys who who can break down and beat people from X and wrap the corner or inside roll or get up and question mark and things like that because the it's it's really kind of a midfield, you know, wing pairs dominant stuff in the summer, mostly. And you know, people have really embraced kind of what you know your mentality and your philosophy, and so those guys are harder to find. Now you don't necessarily need that guy, but if you believe, you know finding a guy like Sam King is harder to find these days, you know, just because there's so yeah. much. I don't know. I kind of feel like, I feel like it's, it's always been hard to find those guys. And it's yeah. like, and those guys are, you know, few and far between the Mikey Powell's and all the Powell brothers for that matter. The, the, all the Virginia always seem to have some guys like that. And, and, you know, Notre Dame did back in the day too, you know, being back to the Ulrichs. Like if you can have somebody that can, break you down from behind it, it creates you know the stanwicks it creates easy goals you know that all of a sudden they have to start paying attention and maybe have to slide back there and you're feeding from back there i think the reason why everyone's going to the pairs is it's a lot easier to find really good wing guys and um you know you only really have to play on one side at a time if you want to play that way but to be able to have that two-handed guy you know think about denver like you know, when they were really good, they had those X guys, you know, whether it was Canizaro or Law or whatever. Yeah. Um, the two-handed guy that could come around and score it, and play off the ball that way, and, and and to be able to, you know, beat a matchup sometimes too. Yep. Yeah. Um, what about midfield. from a from – Midfield. A, yeah, midfield. Let's talk about it. Two-way guys. Two-way. You know? And which is harder to find for the same same reason as – you know, guy, there's no riding in the summer. 
you know, guys are just turning and running to the box. Like one of the first things we have to do at every practice is basically I stand on one of the face up wings with like almost a, a, an imaginary stop sign and be like, turn around, stop. Like Kevin Bacon in Animal House. All is well. <laughs> Remain calm. Get back and ride. We'll sub Before you, you later. You know, so, um, you know, guys, you know, like the box is going to move. Like it's all of a sudden going to be a different part of the field, you know. So um, that mentality, you got to recruit that mentality. Like after when guys commit or the commit to the process here at Harvard, it's one of the first things I say is don't come off the field. You know, try not to come off the field, you know. Pretend like you got cotton in the ears, you know. You're a better athlete than the D middies that are club teams. Club teams are running D middies now, you yeah. know, like which is just systemic. Well, it's easier to, you know, to to get a couple more guys on on the midfield depth roster. Yeah. Put some more money. And so so yeah, I think, you know, two way guys and and you know, it and more often than not, it's it's less of a athleticism issue. It's more of a mindset issue. Like I always say, do you would you, do you like to play? I love playing coach. Then don't come off the field. Yeah, why are you coming off? You'll get in great. You'll get in great shape, and you don't have to be great at it. And if you want to ride, you need you have to have two way guys, and you have to have know how guys you know know how to sub and and stuff like that. So, you know, midfielders and and I like I like variety too. Tall guys, small guys, all different shapes and sizes. So I don't I don't get caught up in everybody's got a little Your prototype. No. All right, so you love two-way guys. You want to play two-way lacrosse. Obviously, it allows you to push transition if you want to. It allows you to get back in the hole. It allows you to ride. How much – everybody – but it seems like everybody wants to do that, but when push comes to shove, everybody pretty much you know, stops doing it after about one game, and right. then they go right back to their defensive middies uh, as much as humanly possible and get and then get their, their first line in whenever they can too. And I think some of the teams that have a tremendous amount of depth and experience, yeah, they've converted offensive middies into D middies. And so not only are they maybe trying to trap people, but they're just integrating them right into their offense. Like they're, they're taking, you know, four to six possessions a game and saying, all right, you, you got a Harvard offensive midi down there. Just stay in play. That's nice to have that kind of, or just hang out and play a little five on five. Well, uh, you know, same thing. Yeah. So yeah. it's nice to have that depth. I think, you know, we'll, we'll ultimately get there ourselves. Yeah. It's going to take a couple of years of recruiting. Well, Burns, yeah. um, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, taking a day out of your, uh, of your summer from the Northern uh, headquarters, world headquarters. Um, and um, I can't wait to see what you do this year and we'll be in touch. Well, you have, you have to come up and, you know, Maybe, I'll be there. Special, special special appearance. Teach us, you know, teach us the ways of the Monroe. <laughs> I think I'm going to be up there in uh, early September, so I'll I'll check in on that. You are, you got to come come by practice. We'll, you know, you know some of the guys on our our yep. team, and we'd love to have you uh, come by practice and drop some knowledge. I'll be there. Have a good one. All right. All right Thanks, man. man. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Goodbye.